Well, good evening. It's time to get started tonight. Get everyone to stand. We're going to start off tonight. We're going to sing Joy to the World. Thank you, Brother Richard, and good evening. How's everybody doing? Yeah. Amen. Anybody blessed? Yeah. Amen. Good to see you tonight. Would you please pray with me tonight? Father, God, we thank you once again for allowing us to come in here tonight, God, to worship you, Father God. I just pray to God that you would just, God, just reach down and remove any and um, every distraction, God, that would prevent us from worshiping you tonight, dear Father God. Any and every distraction that would prevent us uh, from hearing a fresh word from you tonight, dear God. God, so I thank you so very much, God, for our faith family at Black Rock, dear God, and how we can uh, fellowship together and worship uh, together tonight. God, may you be pleased, God, with the worship that you received tonight. Father, we love you, and we thank you for how you will minister to your children tonight. Lord God, we love you and bless you. In Christ's name, we pray believing. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Please be seated. And just a few things I want to share with you as uh, we got Christmas coming up on Sunday, so don't forget our service is at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and uh, we, would, we would love to see you, but listen, I promise you, I won't send you any kind of hate email, where are you at on Christmas Day? You know, we want you to spend time with your family. It's very, very important, but we um, uh, planned a 2 o'clock service that way. Hopefully, you know, you wouldn't have to choose uh, family or church, so hopefully you have time to do both of them. But if not, you know, we'll look forward to seeing you the, um, sometime in the next year. But also, something just to uh, uh, haven't really mentioned yet is also on Christmas Day for our service, we'll, we'll, um, we'll observe the Lord's table, so we'll have communion on Christmas Day, so uh, I, I definitely look forward to that. I know it's been a little, a little while since we've had it, so we'll have communion on Christmas Day. New Year's Day, don't forget that's also on a Sunday. We won't have Sunday school or evening service, just one ten thirty service on New Year's Day, so be mindful of that. And uh, we just look forward just to having a great, great time tonight, and God willing, Sunday on Christmas Day. And so with that being said, would you please stand and go. I know you've already been fellowshipping a lot, but we build, we build this into our service. So go ahead and go fellowship a little bit more tonight. Thank you. 
Let's sing Angels We Have Heard On High. seated. We'll sing Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And this will be our Reconcile, joyful, all ye nations, rise. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity to pause from the cares of the world and to gather together tonight, Father, and make our prayers and our petitions known. We come to you, Father, because we have faith to believe that you hear our prayers and that you have the ability to answer our prayers and that you do answer them in accordance with your divine will. Lord, we thank you for this special time of the year that uh, we celebrate uh, the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that um, each one of us here, Lord, would uh, uh, not say, as the innkeeper said, that there was no room in the inn, but, Lord, that we would each one invite Jesus into a special place into our hearts, Lord, that uh, that he would sit on the throne of our hearts, Father. Uh, that's his rightful place because he purchased us with his shed blood on Calvary's cross. And Lord, he is King of King and Lord of Lords. And may we always realize that, Lord, and may we always put our, our faith and our trust and may our obedience and our adoration and, and love and praise uh, all be directed to him, Lord. Lord, we thank you for this time that you've given us to uh, participate in the offering, Lord. We ask now that this offering would be used to magnify the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you to our orchestra, as always, sounding great with the tunes of the season. Please take a copy of God's Word and find uh, John chapter number 20. With me tonight, John chapter number 20, as we are continuing our study of the Gospel of John on Wednesday nights. Tonight, our subject is going to be Believing is Seeing. Believing is Seeing. John chapter number 20. And when you find your place there, and if you can physically stand, please stand with me tonight as we honor and reverence the reading of the Word of God tonight, speaking on this subject, Believing is Seen. John chapter number 20, begin reading in verse number 24. Now Thomas called the twin, one of twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hand the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, and look at my hands, and reach your hand here, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life 
in His name. Father God, I pray You'd speak deep into our hearts. May You do this tonight for our good, but for Your glory. God, we pray this believe in because we ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Believing is seen. We have all heard someone say at one point in another in our lives, they say this, I'll believe it when I what? See it. They say, I'll believe it when I see it. I like what one boy told me one time. He said, he said, Preacher, I don't believe anything I hear and only half of what I see. That's not bad advice, okay? He said, I don't believe anything I hear and only half of what I see. When it comes to spiritual things, when it comes to the things of God, when it comes to heaven, please hear me tonight. Because listen, if you will not believe in God until you see him, please hear me, you will see him, but at that moment, it'll be too late for you. Let me say that again. If you and your viewpoints of Christianity, heaven, uh, spiritual things are, you're waiting to see God so that you can believe in him, you will see God, but at that moment you would have waited too long because I am convinced that our Bible teaches us that every person, every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, they will have a face-to-face encounter with God. We will either stand before him as a Christian at the Bema seat of Christ, or the, as the lost world, as John the Revelator spoke so clearly of in Revelation, the lost world will stand before God at the great white throne judgment, and for the first and last time, they will see God, and they'll never see Him again. Jesus taught Thomas in, in, in our passage tonight a very important lesson that is still very relevant 2,000 years later today. The lesson was this, seeing does not save you, but believing does. Seeing Jesus does not save you, but believing in Jesus does save us. Notice our text in verse 24 and 25. Now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So John, the apostle who wrote this, he lets us know that when he performed a roll call of the upper room, that there were two of the disciples Missing Judas, as we know, he removed himself permanently uh, by hanging himself. But he lets us know that Thomas, he was not there, and he removed himself temporarily by hiding himself. Now, I don't know why he wasn't there. Now, we can speculate, we can assume until the cows come home, but we just don't know why he wasn't there. Maybe he had, maybe Thomas that night, because if you just remember, Last Wednesday night, we studied how Jesus, on that Sunday, that Sunday evening service on Resurrection Sunday, Jesus stepped into the room without any doors opening, and he met the ten disciples that were there, and he, and, and he uh, spoke a message of peace, but then he also gave them an assignment to go and to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to bear and to proclaim the message of forgiveness. And so yet Thomas was not there. So the question that we will probably live with the rest of our lives, why was he not there? Maybe he had some similar excuses like people use today. Thomas might have told the guys, well, you know what? And you know, uh, 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 we shouldn't be gathered together. There's, you know, the uh, the Pharisees have been looking for us. We shouldn't go. Guys, you know what? I'm going to stay home and have church at my house. Guys, I can get enough at home as I can there. Guys, you know what? If I go there, Peter's going to be there, and Peter loves to talk, and he's just going to talk and talk and talk, so I'm just going to stay home. Listen, like I said, we can speculate all night long. I have no idea why Thomas missed that night, but verse 25 lets us know that, uh, it, it lets us know that, that Thomas's faith was obviously floundering. Look at verse 25. The other disciple therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, and this is Thomas speaking, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side. Now notice his words. He says, I will not believe. Now, history has given him the name of Doubting Thomas. His birth name was Thomas, or as some of your translations may say, Didymus, which both of those, by the way, mean twin. Now, um, did he possibly have a biological twin running around? There's a good chance of that. But can I take a stab in the dark and go as far to say tonight that although we may not be Thomas's biological twin, I think a lot of times, a lot of us, if not most of us, fit into the category of being a spiritual twin to Thomas. That's okay. I didn't, I didn't expect to get a lot of amens right there. 
Because we, just like Thomas, we could, although Thomas was saved, I'm convinced he was, he was saved, he had a moment of doubt in his life. So listen, if you're here tonight and you know there's been a moment in your life when you placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you know that his blood has cleansed you, but yet there is still some doubt in your heart. That does not mean that you're lost. It just means you have some questions. And so Thomas, in this passage here, he, he, he had some questions. And you know, before we're so critical on Thomas, what, what, think about what he said. Guys, I will not believe. He didn't say, I cannot believe. He says, I will not believe. When he says, I cannot believe, that's doubt. But when he says, I will not believe, that is unbelief. And so like I said, before we get too critical on Brother Didymus, on Brother Thomas, remember his statement, I will not believe until I see what? His hands. Until I put my hands into his side, put my hands into uh, the nail prints of his hands. The disciples, guess what they saw? They saw the exact same thing. Because when Jesus stepped into their room in in the previous text, Jesus showed them his hands and his side, and that made them a believer. So we cannot be too critical of Brother Thomas here. So we know know that he's known as Doubting Thomas, but in his passage, in 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 these few first verses, not only do we see a Doubting Thomas, we see a Pouting Thomas. Can't you just see him there? The disciples, they're there for the evening service, first resurrection morn. Thomas is not there. Where's he at? I don't know. Maybe he stayed home. Maybe he went out, uh, here's a good word, gallivanting. We still use that word? I don't know. But anyways, I can see him pouting. He was doubting Thomas, but he was also pouting Thomas. So here's a good question. Why was he pouting? Let me answer my own question. He was pouting because he had missed the assembling of the saints. Amen, preacher. Go ahead. Preach on. That'll preach right there. I believe I will. He was pouting because he had missed the assembling of the saints. Solitude only feeds discouragement and helps it grow into self-pity. Okay, many of us have been there before. Listen, there has there is never there is never a good time to disassociate yourself from the church. There is never, there is never a good time to isolate yourself from fellow believers. Whenever you are, whenever you going through times of doubts, whenever you're going through times of discouragement, that is the last thing you should do is to isolate yourselves from the faith family. Listen, when we are going through through situations like Thomas was, he was he was he was right slab dab in the middle of what we call a crisis of belief. He was hinging. Uh, he was hinging on believing, not believing, following, not following. And so in, in, in the midst of that situation, that is when he needed the other disciples, which, which, which represents his faith family. And if you don't get anything else out of this message tonight, get this. When we are going through times of discouragement and doubt and, and when fear is trying to just paralyze us, that is not the time to stay home and away from Sunday school and away from worship and away from church. That is the time to lean in even more. Listen to what the Bible says. This member, this whole thing, this whole Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. So listen to what the Bible says about this in Hebrews 10, 25. You've all heard this all of your lives. But notice what the, notice what the message is here. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So what is our purpose for being here to encourage one another, to encourage one another. So if he was indeed pouting, Thomas, he was pouting because he missed the assembling of the saints. Not only, was Tom, not only did Thomas miss the assembling of the saints, notice also he missed the assignments of the saints. Look back at verse 21 of this text. So Jesus said to them again, this is Jesus' first appearance when Thomas was not there. It was just the other ten. He said, he said peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. So Jesus, he, he gave an assignment to them. In verse 22, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of many, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So on the first resurrection morning, when Jesus, or first the evening service, Jesus appeared to them, and they, the ones that assembled together, they were at church, 
They, they was not missing out on this. Jesus supernaturally stepped into their situation, and he gave them an assignment. Now, you understand that if Thomas would have been there, he should have been there, he would have gotten his assignment right then and there. So he goes on pouting. He goes on in, in, uh, living a defeated life, living in discouragement, because he missed out on God's assignment for his life. So you see, the ten... Man, they're jazzed. They have no more fear. The Bible says when they first gathered there, they gathered together for fear of the Jews. Look at there in, chapter, in verse 19. But when Jesus stepped in to the situation, you, you no longer read anything else about fear. But now Jesus has removed their fear, inflated their faith, and now they're ready to go on and complete their assignments. So we see their joy is restored, and they are ready to serve Jesus. Do you see that? You don't see that in Thomas. Thomas has no joy. He wants to stay away. And listen, he, does, he, is, he is not serving Jesus. Let, here, let me ask you this question. Do you, know, do you know why he was defeated and not serving Jesus? Because he was defeated and not serving Jesus. You got that right? He was defeated and not serving Jesus because he was defeated and not serving Jesus. I've never been there. I've read uh, 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 tons of literature about the, about the Dead Sea. How many of you have been to the Dead Sea before? Got a few of us? Been to the Dead Sea over in the Holy Lands. You know, everything that I read tells me that the Jordan River, it ends at the Dead Sea. It flows down into it. But once they get to the Dead Sea, the reason why they call it the Dead Sea, guess why? It, 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 doesn't, it, it doesn't channel out anywhere. It doesn't go anywhere. Salt content is around 31, 32%. So... Nothing can live there. It's just like a, it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a body of water that, where, where nothing can live. So get the, get the imagery in your mind. Jordan River flows down to it. It ends there. It does not go anywhere. It represents just death. Preacher, sure where are you going with this? I'm glad you've asked. Because I want you to see this analogy, how this can compare with your life and my life. Did you know there's a danger? That if all we ever do, please hear me, if all we ever do is come to church and just let God's word flow into my life, I can come to Sunday school and let God's word flow into my life. I can come to worship and let his word stream into my life. But if I never let God's word flow through my life, listen, the Dead Sea never distributes water nowhere else it is not a conduit. It just gathers there and does nothing. Now, you can pat yourself on the back if you want to about how many times you come to church, but if all you ever do is come just to gather and you never scatter what God has done in your life, you will eventually become a lifeless lump of clay. You're welcome. God is never intended for us just to come, collect, gather, go home, come back, collect, and gather. No, God, listen, God is not concerned about flowing his blessing to my life if he knows I will not let him flow his blessing through my life. We are to be a reservoir, and we are to be a, 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 just a, a channel of blessing. We, we sing the song, right? Let my life be a channel of blessing. How, how, how often do we sing the song, Let My Life Be the Dead Sea? That's not a good song, right? We don't sing it, but a, but a lot of people live it. If you miss the assembling, you may miss your assignment. Verse 25. The other disciples therefore said to him, that, that is written in the, uh, the, the verb tense that is written, they have said to him, it means they kept on saying to him. They kept on encouraging him. Thomas, we saw Jesus. And it was not just his dead body. Thomas, you have to believe us. Thomas, you know, they kept on saying to him. That's what the verse implies. They kept on saying to him. But basically, Thomas, it, their message and their testimony just bounced off him because he, had a, he, had, he was in danger of forming very hard hearts. And their, and their words and their testimony was just bouncing off of him. It was as if Thomas was saying, your words aren't touching me. I just need to touch him. Verse 26. And after eight days, 
his disciples were, were again inside. By the way, the Jews, when they would count days, they would count the day that they're ending and then begin with the next day. So if the last meeting was on a Sunday night, you count eight more days, and guess what? They're gathered once again on a Sunday night. This, verse 26, the setting is, is, is eight days, one week away, Sunday night. They're again inside, and Thomas, he's with them now. Notice the Bible said Jesus came, the doors being shut, and he stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands, and reach your hand here and put it to my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. So every time Jesus has a every time there is a, a, a corporate gathering of Christians, I believe this happens. There's a general message, and then there is a very specific message. Without exception, every time a body of believers get together, there's a general message, and then there's a specific message. In verse 26, Jesus supernaturally appears in the room, and he has a general message for all of them. Verse 26, his general message for all of them is peace to you. That was for everybody. But then we can see him turn and pivot toward Thomas. And then he has a very specific message for Thomas. Did you know every church service is like that? You might be here tonight, and you might be here just for a, just for a God may have you here just for a general message, but you know what? You might be here tonight, and God, he has a laser-type focus on you, and he has a specific message for you. I don't know. I don't know who, has, uh, who was here for a general, who's here for a specific, detailed message, and, but you know right now, maybe God has already just been really working on your heart and touching your heart. But listen, we finite beings, we can never predict when the infinite God would step out of heaven and really have a message for us. That's why it's so critically important that we are at church whenever we can. And listen, I'm not condemning anybody about vacationing and being sick. But when we can be here, we ought to be here so we won't miss out on what God has for us. But pay attention to Jesus' message. This is something we all need to hear. Notice, it, notice his, his specific message to Thomas. Verse 27. Then he said, Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it to my side. Notice this. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Please hear this next statement. Neither faith nor unbelief stand still. Both are either diminishing or growing. Are, are, you, are you tracking with me? Neither faith or unbelief stand still. Either of them, both of them are either diminishing or growing. What does that look like in our lives? Listen, if you have placed your faith in Jesus, uh, uh, your faith is not standing still at the moment you got saved. Either your faith is growing in Jesus or your unbelief is growing. Jesus knew that Thomas, he, he, uh, he was in danger of becoming a hard-hearted believer. And so that's why his message was to, his, his specific message to him was do not be unbelieving stop stop believing your doubts but he said start uh, he said but uh, you need to build on your faith and I love the statement that Rick Coram shared this past January at our revival and I'm going to quote him he said if you believe your doubts long enough you'll begin to doubt your beliefs and that's such a powerful word if you believe your doubts long enough you will begin to doubt your beliefs you know how good our Jesus is? Somebody say, preacher, how good is our Jesus? I'm glad you've asked. Here's how good our Jesus is. Jesus, if he wanted to, matter of fact, if I know I've done this before, but if I was Jesus and I, and I was in that room, I would have slapped Thomas upside his head. Whoa, what you thinking? You better believe in me, son. Not Jesus. Did Jesus condemn him for being a doubter? No. He just lovingly got down on his level and encouraged him back into the faith. That's how we know Jesus was not a Baptist because he didn't kick the brother when he was down. Oh, it's getting real in here tonight, isn't it? 
We need, our, we need to feed our faith. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God is protein for our soul. It is protein for our faith. Verse 28. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. So Thomas, if you remember in verse 25, Thomas was adamant. He told his, his colleagues, the other disciples, I must touch his uh, uh, side. I must see the nail prints. I must touch them. He was adamant. He had to touch. But when, in verse, when, uh, but when Jesus appeared before him, no longer did he need to touch his wounds. Listen, Thomas no longer needed to reach out and touch Jesus. Why? Because Jesus' ministry was so powerful that Jesus' ministry of restoration, it reached out and it already touched the heart of Thomas. Friends, that is the kind of ministry that we need. Let me say it again. That, this here is the kind of ministry that we need. We, you and I, I don't give a rip if you're on staff here or salary, if you have a position, don't have a position. We have been called, the Bible says we have been called into the ministry of reconciliation and our ministry ought to be so effective. Listen, we ought to be so connected to Jesus and filled with his spirit that nobody has to go around touching us. But listen, we need to be so plugged into Jesus, connected to him and filled with his spirit that when God calls us into ministry that we are impacting and we are inspiring people and we are just uh, being a blessing to somebody man I just I love how Jesus touched this boy's heart this is the kind of ministry we need and if you notice I, I couldn't help but notice this I, I, I noticed the comparison when Jesus on the first Sunday night first resurrection when he stepped into the other ten disciples and said, peace to you. The Bible says there in uh, verse 19, or verse 20. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Well, that's good. They got glad. But notice the comparison between the disciples and Thomas. They got glad, but were silent. The Bible doesn't say they said anything. Not Thomas. Oh, Thomas. He went from, he went from pouting Thomas to doubting Thomas, to finally, when Jesus got a hold of him, he went to shouting Thomas. He said in verse 28, he made it personal. He didn't say, Lord God. He said, my Lord. He said, my God. When he called Jesus Lord, he put Jesus on the throne of his heart. When he, said, when he called Jesus God, he put, God, he put Jesus on the throne of the universe. So he made it personal, personable, and he just, he just made that cry and that declaration, my God, or my, uh, excuse me, my Lord and my God. Verse 29, Jesus bestows here a special beatitude in verse 29. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Notice this beatitude here. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. By the way, all the disciples believed after seeing Jesus. John, Peter ran down the tomb. It was after seeing the empty tomb. It was after that that the Bible says in John 20, verse 9, that John saw and believed. So all of them saw and believed. Please hear me. Seeing is what not saved the disciples. Believing in Jesus is what saved the disciples. Let's say it again. Seeing did not save them, but believing in Jesus, that is what saved them. Did you know many people in Jesus' day saw him, but not everybody that saw him was saved? Is that a true statement? Not everybody that saw him were saved because there were many that saw him. There were many that even saw him after his resurrection that remained unbelievers. But the ones who believed in Jesus, they are the ones that are still in heaven today. They are in heaven alive and well. You know, it's all well and good that the early Christians, they got to see their Lord and to know he was alive. They had the assurance because they seen the risen Lord Please hear me. We don't have to see the risen Lord to have the same assurance that they had. 
See, because listen, to us, seeing is not believing, but believing is seeing. Once we believe in Jesus Christ, and once we believe in the Word of God, then we can have the exact same assurance that the disciples had, the ones that seen with their own eyeballs the risen Lord. That is what belief does. That is why belief in Jesus is so powerful. Look at verse 30. And truly, John goes on to say, and truly, Jesus did many other signs, another word for miracles, in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. It has been said there were 32 miracles that, that Jesus performed that are recorded in our New Testament. John, he selected only eight of them, only eight of the 32. And he goes on to let us know that, it, that, no, that, uh, uh, that nobody could write the, the volumes of books that, that, were, that, would, that were necessary to record all of the miracles of Jesus. He, he performed so many of them. But the miracles that John selected, the eight that he chose, they described, the, and they dis, they show, he, he chose them to, to prove to his readers, you and I, he, he pro- to prove to us, he wants us to, 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 uh, uh, he wants us to see the deity of Christ. So let me say this, his miracles are important. The miracles of Jesus are important. But know this, sinners are not saved by believing in miracles. Sinners are saved by believing in Jesus. I didn't come to faith by looking up to heven. God, I believed you feed the I believe I believe you fed the 5000. Take me to heaven. No. Jesus, I believed you walked on water. Take me to heaven. No. Believing in his miracles does not save us. Listen, the, these are, they uh, they are very important to bring to bring validity to the deity of Christ, but we're saved by believing in Jesus. Listen, John was not a professor writing to explain a subject. No. He was an evangelist writing to achieve an object. What was the object he was trying to achieve? Verse 31. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have what? Life in his name. That was John's desire. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, he wrote for the sole purpose that lost people would believe in Jesus Christ. And please hear me, we're just about finished. Nobody in this room, none of us will ever write a book that will be contained in the Bible and have our name pinned to it. None of us will. The Bible is done. We have the complete revelation. So you know what? You might, you might be able to write some inspired writings you might be able to write some inspired songs. But none of us, God is not going to call on any of us to, uh, 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 to, uh, to put any additions into the book. It's done. So with that being said, although, although God may not call on us to write another book to put into his Bible, you do know this, right? Your life and my life is the greatest gospel that anybody can read. Listen to this. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are read by more than a few. But the one that is most read is the Gospel according to you. You are writing a Gospel, a chapter each day, by the things you do and the things you say. Men read what you write, whether faithless or true. Say, what is the Gospel according to you? Are you living a life that expresses to other people their need for Jesus Christ? Verse 31 ends with, But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that seeing you may have life in His name. Is that what your Bible says? No. It does not say that seeing. It says, and that believing you may have life in whose name? His name. His name. Seven times in the Gospel of John, John records Jesus making the seven great I Am statements. And you know what that does? Every time Jesus made an I am statement, that equated him with God. Every single time, I am the bread bread of life. I am the light of the world. Every time Jesus made that statement, he lets us know that he was God with skin on. He was God in the flesh. 
And so the verse goes on to say that, uh, and that believing in, 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 and that believing you may have life in His name, in the name of Jesus. So when He says that you may have life, that implies that lost people are what? Dead. Ephesians 2.1 says these words, And you, He made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, before we come to faith in Jesus Christ, before we uh, put our belief in Jesus Christ, we were not just sick. We were not just uh, weak. Oh, no. The Bible says we were dead. We didn't need to be resuscitated. We needed to be resurrected. We needed the supernatural life of Jesus. When you see the word life right there, you need to understand in the Greek, that is the word Zoe life. That is the godlike life. That is eternal life. Life. That is the life that God lives. And the only way, the only way to get that life is by believing in the name of Jesus Christ. There is life in his name. In this chapter, what have we seen? Let me just summarize really, really quick. We see in this chapter, John chapter 20, amazing chapter. We see the ten disciples, they were changed from fear to to courage when they believed in the name of Jesus. We see Thomas change from unbelief to confidence when he believed in the name of Jesus. Now John invites anybody and everybody in this room who has never trusted Jesus Christ to be changed from death to eternal life. Hey, whatever category you're in here tonight, if you're like the ten and your life is full of fear, Jesus can, he can remove that fear and he can give you courage. Maybe you, maybe you are struggling and wrestling with unbeliefs in your life. The name of Jesus is powerful enough that when you put your belief in him, he can give you the confidence that you need to live a victorious life. And if you're here tonight and you have never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, by believing in His name, he can, he, can, he can transform you from death to life. Whatever you may need, Jesus is the great I Am. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Father, we look towards heaven tonight. God, I thank you in advance for meeting the needs of of your people. God, if there's somebody here tonight who wants to lay down on the altar of fear, maybe, maybe they, want to lay, they want to come and lay, lay down some insecurities. Maybe they want to come and, and just uh, get rid of their unbelief, dear God, and, and they need courage and they need confidence and, and they just need your security, dear God. May they not walk out the same way they walked in. And God, if there's someone here tonight that needs to be saved, God, they are, they are still dead. According to your word, they are still and they're still dead in trespasses and, and sins. God, I pray that you would just step out of heaven, step into their lives tonight. I know, God, I know you can do this, and I pray believing you will. God, may who, uh, whoever you are speaking to, God, there, there are some, they, they got a general message of, of, of encouragement, and, and they ought to be grateful that they come to church, because if they did not come, they would have missed that, like Thomas missed. But God, if there's somebody here tonight who you are specifically speaking and you are addressing their hearts, God, I pray that your spirit would be, be so loud inside their soul that they cannot ignore you. God, give them boldness either to be saved, give them boldness to repent, give them boldness to, uh, to bring their unbelief. Uh, if Thomas never would have, uh, have confessed his unbelief, he, he would have died that way. God, I pray. Give us liberty right now. God, set, set uh, somebody free right now. God, I pray this believing that you can and will because we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand with me tonight if you can? And hey, uh, maybe you was here tonight just for that general message. I don't know. You know. You know right now what's taking place in your soul. And I don't. I can't do an inventory on you, but you know. But if God, the Holy Spirit, is calling you to step out, to make a decision, don't, re don't leave here with regrets. Be obedient to the Lord. Be obedient to Him. 
Don't wait for the singer. Go ahead and sing, brother. If you would go ahead and go ahead and start singing. Don't, you gotta wait for that. You ain't gotta wait for the second verse or the third verse. I don't know how many there's gonna be, but just come. Just come. Maybe you don't. Maybe you're, you're not sure of what it is. We'll figure it out. God will. He'll turn the light on in your soul. He wants you to know. Softly he wants you to know. And Jesus go ahead and come. Whoever you are is calling, calling for you. heads and hearts in attitude of prayer. Pray with me tonight for all those that are on our list. And, and as I pray for them,